Okay, welcome. Uh, my name is Jennifer, and I am the um, director of our GRI services in Cape. And we just want to welcome you guys, and thank you for coming out tonight for our colon cancer awareness um, and our panel that we have here to discuss um, colon cancer. And um, first, we'd like to kick it off with Miss Maxine Holloway. She is our patient testimonial. Um, I came in contact with her a couple of years ago, and. Um, really had a wonderful conversation and been kind of holding her in my back pocket to get her to give her testimonial. So we're excited to have her here today. We're going to give her a little bit of time to just kind of talk about um, her experience and what she went through and what led her um, to get screened or get checked. So. Okay. Yeah, I would like to say good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Maxine Holloway, and I'm a colon cancer survivor. Okay, uh, I started off working. I does a lot of work and working 12 hours a day. All of a sudden, I got sick. I had been losing weight, and I thought it was from working out. Me and my husband worked out a lot, and I hadn't been able to work out because I was doing a lot of working. Well, I started getting sick at work, and I was eating a little bit. Then I couldn't eat anymore, so I went home and I laid down yeah. because I figured it was just hard. Right. So after that, it went on for two days, and my knee was a tears. So well, when I got really sick, and I was like, okay, when I get up to make it, we're going to go to the hospital. So I went to the urgent care, you're in sight, and they diagnosed me as an inner stomach infection. Well, they gave me some medicine to take, told me I was dehydrated, and said, no. Well, I didn't know when you dehydrate, you can't eat or take medicine. So I did that from Friday to from Wednesday to Friday. Well, on Friday I got worse, and I sat there and I got up and I got dressed. I sat on the couch and the Lord spoke to me and said, I had cancer, I was gonna be okay. Well, from there we, we said, what you wanna do? I can go to the hospital, take me the cake, straight the cake. If I die, I die going to cake. That's just how I felt at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so we went to cake, we went to South Beach Hospital. So we got there and they said, you dehydrated. I said, that's what they told me on Wednesday. And they like, what? So they took me in, brain testing, a bit me in. From there, that's when I met my doctors. Thank God for my doctors. Amen. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> so I got back up a little bit. I got really sick, and I couldn't eat nothing and drink anything. And I did that for three days. And I'm like, something's going on. And from there, I went to the hospital. When I got there, they checked me out. And they said, well, we're going to have to do a colonoscopy, which I had had one before, and that's showed up. So I went there, and they did that. I um, first met Dr. Bartow, and I said, okay, so I don't like drinking that medicine. I'm sure nobody does. Mm -hmm. But we did that, and he came in, he said, oh, you have colon cancer. I'm like, colon cancer? He said, yes. And I asked him, I said, do you believe in God? And he said, yes. I said, I'll do what you tell me. You do what you got to do. And we'll go from there. And then after seeing him, we did the surgery. I met Dr. Kelly, mm -hmm. and from there, Dr. Moore. So we must listen to our body. When we're not feeling good, get checked out. Show sure up. It's very important. Cancer is not what kills us. What we don't know is what kills us. Because I know we get cancer, we all get panic on when we die. No. I'm a living testimony that you don't have to Show them out. And the doctor told me that you listen to your body. And so we must do that. Listen to our body, get checked, and go to the doctor. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> Thank God, my three doctors, y'all are my three angels. <laughs> <laughs> I still see them and I love y'all. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we'd like to kick this off by first introdu um, introducing you to our panel. Um, Maxine's done a wonderful job of kind of already starting to do that. But um, So we've got Dr. Keller here on the end. He's our gastroenterologist at Southeast. We have Beth Altenthal. She is our... Um, I don't know your exact title. Nurse Navigator. Nurse Navigator. So she does a lot of with our patients to navigate them through the process once they are diagnosed with cancer. And then also doing a lot of um, big role in our genetic testing as well. And then we've got Dr. Barto here. He is a general surgeon uh, with Cape Surgical Clinic. And then Dr. Moore is one of our oncologists at Southeast too. Um, so we kind of have some things set up and then we're going to open it up for questions after and hopefully wrap it up by um, about 7.30, okay? Um, so, Dr. Keller, do you want to kick us off and kind of tell us why it's important to get a colonoscopy and maybe a little bit about prevention of colon cancer? Sure. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Yeah, um, yeah so uh, colonoscopy is our um, main um, 
modality to, to look for colon cancer, and um, colon cancer is a very preventable cancer. You certainly, like Ms. Maxine said, you want to um, listen to your body. If you feel like you're having symptoms, which would be bleeding or pain or um, uh, constipation or bloating or something of this nature, then you certainly want to get checked out. But we would like to prevent this from happening. So pre colon cancer prevention is, is the key in trying to find these polyps. And polyps are growths in our colon. They're kind of like moles, for lack of a better description. And those growths can turn into colon cancer. And if we can take those polyps out before they turn into colon cancer, um, then we can prevent the cancer from, from occurring. And right now the guidelines for African Americans is age 45 to get screened. Um, and that would be um, with colonoscopy. And then for whites, it's actually age 50. Now there is some discrepancy right now. The American Cancer Society is saying actually we're gonna move that up to age 45 as well for whites. Um, but right now, um, it's age 50. And I imagine it's gonna be dropped down to age 45 in, in, the, uh, in the near future. But it's certainly a preventable cancer and something that we can um, uh, uh, take care of. And if we do find a cancer, um, like in Ms. Maxine's, uh, um, case, if we find it early enough, uh, it can be treated and, and cured, and um, so it's a very treatable cancer if we find it in early stages. Um, as far as diet goes, well, I get a lot of questions about diet. Um, there's no like, hard, fast guidelines. There is, um, with ground beef, there is a, a thought that uh, more than two servings of ground beef a week um, increases your risk for colon cancer, and actually countries that are vegetarian have a low risk, have a low incidence of colon cancer. Um, so that kind of speaks to the, the red meat and ground beef more specifically. Um, there is a recommendation to take a baby aspirin that help with uh, polyp prevention. It's not, um, you'll take a baby aspirin and it'll totally prevent polyps, but it will help. And there's some studies looking at aspirin type medications that show in, in folks that have genetic syndromes like polyposis, you can decrease the amount of pops you get with an inset, like like a baby aspirin. So that's an, another uh, way to help prevent. Um, and then there's some thought about vitamin D. Taking vitamin D will help uh, with pop prevention. Um, so I don't know. Are we gonna have questions at the end, or do we? Yes, we okay. were gonna open up questions at the end. Okay. So, um, Beth, would you like to talk about the importance of genetic testing and how it helps with prevention, and maybe what your role is? Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so currently I'm the nurse navigator at the Cancer Center and I also have started the genetic testing program with the Cancer Center too, but we do outline with the patients from other facilities and doctors and stuff like that to get referred, like Dr. Keller will refer me some patients and things like that. And currently there's been 24 genes that have been identified that can mutate and cause colon cancer in family members, and it can get passed down along the family tree. So what we do is we uh, test the person, preferably that has had the cancer, to see if they had the gene mutation. And if they've had the gene mutation, then we want to uh, start testing what we call cascade, which is testing their children and their siblings to see if they also have the gene mutation. The reason being is if they have the gene mutation, we want to get them started in prevention, meaning if you have a gene mutation that can cause cancer, with colon cancer, your risk goes up to 52 to 99 percent, depending on what gene mutation you have. So we really want to get that colonoscopy started and things. And if you have a gene mutation, they recommend that you start colonoscopies for at the age of 20 to 25, and you're getting them every year to every two years with that gene mutation. Another thing I do is if we have a person comes in and they, uh, we do a test on them and they have a gene mutation and they're not fixed up with a physician or their physician is unaware of what to do with that gene mutation, then I work with them to either get them into a physician or make sure that the physician knows what type of testing and the frequency of how they need to be done. So Beth, if you're not a patient of our cancer center currently, are they still able yes, to get into Yes, they are more than welcome to just call up to the cancer uh, center and ask to speak with me, and we can get them set up. And who pays for that? Who does it pay for? But currently, we work with a company called Marriott, and at this time, it's zero out of pocket. We work with the insurances, so there's nothing out of the patient's pocket to get the testing done. Okay. Um, 
Um, and Dr. Barto, would you like to talk about the cervical, uh, or cervical, goodness. Oh, my. Surgical. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <Mama>. Surgical. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <I> there. <laughs> Surgical intervention, your relationship with Dr. Keller and Dr. Moore as it relates to surgery um, and the continuum of care there. Sorry. Mm -hmm. no, so I'm Kevin Bartow, I'm one of the surgeons in case. I work with these two guys quite a bit. Um, I recognize a lot of faces. I would say first and foremost, hopefully the big thing is to get your screening colonoscopy because then you don't ever have to see me. And Dr. Keller can take these polyps out that don't turn into cancer and then you don't need a surgeon, okay? So that's, that's the big thing. Tell your family, tell your friends, get your screening colonoscopy. Dr. Keller needs to pay for a new new car, so <laughs> get a colonoscopy. <laughs> but if if you have a cancer, you hear the word cancer and you think, oh my goodness, life's life's over. No, it's not. Right? It's not. And there's better treatments now than there were even five years ago. We do different surgeries now than we did even when I started even seven years ago. We can do things from laparoscopically to robotically. Uh, sometimes we have to do big open surgery depending upon your cancer, but there are options, okay? Um, and we, again, we work together. I work with Keller all the time. He'll call me and say, hey, Mr. So-and-so has a big polyp or cancer. Can you see him tomorrow? And that's the thing about Southeast Health and Cape. Um, the doctors really work together. I'll call Andrew and say, hey, man, I need you to see Mrs. So-and-so tomorrow because she's got a new cancer. And he always says, okay, and I've got a cell phone number and we really communicate well and work well together. And then on the other end, when we see you here, you know, years later, we know you, we've got a good relationship with all of you sure, and your yes. family. And it's, it's, Beautiful relationship. it's, uh, Beautiful. it's not something you see everywhere. No, you, you don't, don't see these a lot in the big cities. So we've got a really, a really special, special center here in Cape, so. Uh, one question that comes up a lot is a lot of people have a fear of like a colostomy bag afterwards. Can you talk about the incidence of that? That's a great question. So that's really low. It's not zero. It depends on where your cancer is in your colon. Um, cancers closer to the bottom are harder to get away to not have to have a permanent colostomy. But I'll say less than 5% need a permanent colostomy, which is, is pretty low. So again, you hear the word cancer in your colon, you think you're gonna live with a bag for the rest of your life. More likely than not, that's not gonna be the case, okay? Thank you, Dr. Barto. And Dr. Moore, you wanna talk about treatments and options and kind of what your role is in um, treating patients who are diagnosed? Yes, um, my name is Andrew Moore and I'm one of the medical oncologists at Southeast Cancer Center. And I will kind of reiterate what Dr. Barto mentioned earlier as well. If we are ever going to make an impact on, you know, curing cancer and decreasing mortality rates, it all starts with the screening. And uh, actually, the New York Times did an article it was about three or four years ago. And so you can imagine a map of the United States up here. We are here in Sykeston, Missouri. We are at ground zero for the highest colon cancer rates per capita in the world. We're not talking about the United States, we're talking about the world. If you look at a map from Perryville, kind of St. Genevieve, Perryville, Missouri, down to Stuttgart, Arkansas, the highest per capita rates of colon cancer in the world. So that's not to scare you, but it, it's, it's here and, it, and it's real. And so. Um, that's not all genetics, and we know that. Um, so very, very important that we're, we're all um, in, involved in encouraging family and friends to, to get your screenings because people don't die of polyps and stage one cancers, okay? It's, it's the, the other ones. And so once, uh, and, and fortunately, our treatments are getting better, um, but uh, if, you are unfortunate and have a stage two or stage three or stage four colon cancer. And stage four means that the cancer has spread beyond the colon, beyond the surrounding lymph nodes, and has gotten into some other organ. Most commonly, that is the liver or the lungs. So if that happens, then 
then Dr. Bartow and Dr. Keller send them to, to me or uh, send you all to me or one of my partners and we talk about systemic treatments or chemotherapies, okay? Um, colon cancer is one of the most treatable cancers that we have when it comes to stage four cancers. But I tell all of my patients, if you have a stage four colon cancer, outside of divine intervention, we cannot cure it. Now we can manage it and we can treat it for a while, but the, the key is finding it early. But there have been significant advances in uh, the past, well, really the past three to five years in our treatment. So kind of standard chemotherapy where you're trying to, to kill the cancer before you kill the patient is still the, the backbone of a lot of our treatments. However, with more personalized medicine and more sophisticated pathology testing, so we can, we can really get to the root cause of what led to your cancer. So uh, we can sequence the genome of your entire cancer. So what 10, 12 years ago cost about $20,000 to sequence the, the genome uh, uh, of, of your own DNA now cost about $200, okay? And so when I get involved, that's one of the first things that we do to see if we can identify a particular mutation that is driving your cancer. You know, because our bodies were designed and our immune systems were designed to recognize cancer and these mutations as foreign. But as we get older, as we're exposed to different things in the environment, these cancers are smart and they evolve and they mutate quicker than our bodies. And so they find ways to escape our immune system, okay? And so a lot of these more sophisticated tests allow us to find smarter ways to treat you so that we don't have to use just controlled poisoning with chemotherapy. We can use targeted treatments where we're just directing towards that mutation. Many times those treatments are much more effective, but they're also much less toxic. And so um, that, that has been uh, uh, fun to see in, in a huge advancement. If one, one area of, of cancer care that we still can have a decent chance of curing despite stage four cancer is if someone has colon cancer that's only spread to their liver, okay? And so there are some new techniques, both surgically but also uh, what we call liver-directed therapies, where we get our, our interventional radiologists where they can inject the tumors directly with chemotherapy or inject them directly with these radiation labeled beads called Y90. Those have been very effective at controlling the disease for longer and longer. So that I have many patients with stage four colon cancer that I've been in Cape now for six years that I've been treating for five, five and a half years, and they're, they're doing well. But still, that comes with a lot of sacrifice and, and nothing is without side effects. So at the end of the day, the key is prevention and finding it early, uh, but there have been many exciting advances in uh, the later stage disease as well. Thank you. There's, um, you guys may have seen a lot of advertisement for um, like Cologuard or Fit Test and things like that. Dr. Keller, can you speak to the big difference between Cologuard, Fit, colonoscopy, and when those are appropriate and why? Sure. Um, yeah, so there are, uh, there are stool tests called Cologuard, um, another one called Fit Test. Um, and these tests, and another one called hemocult stool, which is just checking for blood. Um, the FIT test is more specific for polyps and colon cancer, and the Cologuard more specific for polyps and colon cancer. And these have come out over the last five or so years, and you'll see commercials about them on TV. Um, and then there's colonoscopy. So there's a menu of options, and, and I think the, the thing to remember is the best test is the one that gets done. Certainly, colonoscopy, you have to drink a prep and clean you out, and, um, and you go to the hospital, and you have to take a day off work, and you get medication to, um, uh, to go to sleep, and then we do the procedure to take out the polyps. Um, so that, there's a lot involved there. 
Um, with a fit test, you can check your stool. Um, it is not as good as colonoscopy from polyp detection, which is the name of the game, like we've all discussed up here. We're trying to prevent colon cancer from occurring. And so fit test does test for polyps, but more advanced polyps. Um, and fit test stands for fecal immunochemistry test. And it's just a stool. You, you check your stool for, um, for blood, and it's, specific, and it's more specific for polyps and uh, colon cancer. So, but at the end of the day, it's a better colon cancer detection test than a colon cancer prevention test. Um, same thing with Cologuard. Cologuard is a DNA test that also has a fit test within it, and um, it also checks for polyps in colon cancer. Better colon cancer detection test than a prevention test. But at the end of the day, if you're saying I'm not going to have a colonoscopy, which is the gold standard for um, uh, colon cancer prevention, and colon cancer detection, if, if you're not going to have one, then one of these other tests may be right for you. There are other um, instances where you may qualify more for a stool test than, than the actual colonoscopy initially. I think um, there are pluses and minus to all, minuses to all these. One thing to remember from an insurance standpoint, if you're a pure screening, um, average risk person, which means you're over the age of 45 if you're black and over the age of 50 if you're white, um, and you have no family history, of colon cancer, then your insurance um, is required to cover the colonoscopy um, in full. So it would be a free colonoscopy, essentially. If you have a FIT test or a Cologuard and it's positive, then that's no longer the case. So you'll have a colonoscopy, but you're, you're going to have to come out of pocket for it in some form or fashion. So um, it's something to remember. It is easier to get the stool test, but there are some drawbacks to it. Um, one, they're not as sensitive for polyps and not as sensitive um, for colon cancer, but also it can prevent you from getting the free colonoscopy that's required by law with the new uh, Affordable Health Care Act that was put into play that everybody gets a free colon cancer screening. Um, so it's something to remember. And so if it's positive, what you're saying is if a fit or a colonoscopy or a colon heart is positive, then you're still getting a colonoscopy, right? Or Correct, yeah, I guess I left that part out. So if it's a positive test, stool test, then you're going to end up getting the colonoscopy, but it's just not going to be covered fully by, by your insurance. So uh, it, will, it will get covered to a certain point. Everybody's insurance is a little different, uh, but that is one drawback to it. And if you do a colonoscopy and you find polyps, how often does somebody have to come back and continue to get screened and for how long? Okay, so if we find polyps, we remove them that day, and it depends on the number. If you have three or more, three to nine, I should say, you come back in three years. If you have one or two polyps, you come back in five years. If you have no polyps, you come back in 10 years. Um, and if you have 10 or more polyps, then it's, uh, you come back in one year for a repeat. And Beth, could you talk about um, the criteria that somebody would qualify for to go through the genetic testing? Um, like not anybody from the public can just come and get tested, right? There's certain criteria that you have to meet to sort of right. fall under that free screening process. Right. Yeah. right. Man, so, <laughs> so anyway, so as far as with uh, the recommendations with um, getting genetically tested, they've changed the standards so anybody that has had uh, colon cancer or colorectal cancer, 64 years old or less, automatically should be genetically tested. Anybody who has not had cancer and you have a family member who has had colorectal cancer, less than 64, and you have a first degree family member that's been less than 50, everybody, then you qualify to be tested. Or if you have two or more family members at any age that have had colon or colorectal cancer, you qualify to be tested. You take my word for it. Yes, they do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, Dr. Moore, you touched on um, Southeast Missouri and South of Us being a colorectal hot spot. Yeah, um, that. So, that's something that's been big and that I think we know a lot about, but um, do you know um, like any other things that could lead to that or any other um, things that maybe is more prevalent in our area that people could um, 
not do or refrain from doing that would help us to decrease those rates besides getting screened? Absolutely. And so I will start this out in saying that causation is the most difficult thing to, to prove. And uh, hopefully there's no one here from Monsanto. Or <laughs> <laughs> and hey, I, I will admit, my, I come from a family of farmers. And, but if you look at, I personally, I think water supply has a lot to do with um, why we're such a hot hotbed right here. Um, if you look at the Missouri River, coming in there at St. Louis, and then the Ohio River, there at Carroll. I mean, we drain about a third of the country. That water drainage is coming right through here. Um, so uh, most cancers do take kind of a, a two-hit hypothesis. Usually there's kind of a, a, a genetic predisposition of some type. And if there's a real strong genetic predisposition, a lot of times we can pick that up in the family history. And, that's why we do the, the screenings that Beth was talking about. But environment does play a, a huge role. So I always say control what you can control. So what we can control is obesity and smoking and diabetes, okay? And those three things, if you look at Missouri, so the state of Missouri, and you, uh, and you kind of section it out into four quadrants, Southeast Missouri by far has the highest cancer rates per capita, the highest obesity rates per capita, the highest smoking rates per capita, the highest diabetes rates per capita, okay? So although we may be exposed to more in our environment that Southwest Missouri isn't, Northwest or even Northeast Missouri is not, there still are things that we can do. So we know that especially GI cancers, there is a strong correlation uh, between obesity rates and GI cancers. Diabetes, there's also a strong rate uh, a correlation between diabetes and multiple cancers. And the theory behind that is that I, I had mentioned earlier, our immune systems are designed to recognize cancers as foreign. And in particular, there's a, a, a one cell in our immune system, a white blood cell called a T lymphocyte, okay? And those are, I call them like our Navy SEALs uh, of our immune system. They search and destroy, and uh, they, they're spectacular cells. Well, diabetes and high blood sugars stuns or kind of paralyzes your immune system. And so when you have uncontrolled diabetes, your immune system is not near as strong. So, um, you know, control what you can control. So keep your diabetes under control, weight under control, don't smoke, and then... Um, the rest. Don't drink the water. <laughs> well, drink you, the said water. <laughs> you said that. You said that. Dr. Barto, you talked a lot about the different interventions that you're able to do with robotics and um, open procedures and things like that, or even laparoscopic assisted. Can you talk about the different um, recovery periods for that and what that looks like and how you decide um, which procedure you would do for different people? Yeah, so it depends on, again, location of tumors. So the colon's really long, and there's kind of different parts of the colon. So sometimes if the colon's lower down near the bottom, it's a little bit tougher to do a surgery on. And a lot of times we use a fancy robot machine um, to help us. It, it, it can see a little bit better, and it has a little bit better movement with its arms. Um, if it's a big cancer, we usually do a kind of a big open surgery where we have to make a big incision. Usually that's in the hospital, you're in the hospital for four to five days with that. With the robotic surgery, it's, it's a big advance. You can sometimes be in the hospital only two to three days. Um, and then we also do kind of a hybrid laparoscopic surgery, which, which we do a lot still. Um, and again, that's probably two to three to four day in the hospital, depending upon how, how quick your bowels start to recover again. But it's, it's, it's a much, um, you know, used to even 10, 20 years ago, you had surgery, you had tubes coming out of every orifice, yeah. you weren't eating for, you know, a week, and it's not the way anymore. Usually you wake up, you don't have tubes coming out of your nose, you're drinking fluids that night, it just takes, takes a few days to recover in the hospital. And then this next one for you and Dr. Keller both, what is the follow-up interval for somebody who um, is diagnosed with cancer and has surgery? So ongoing, how do you all follow them? 
<laughs> okay, so uh, the year after, so you get diagnosed with colon cancer, you have your, your surgery, then, then the annual colonoscopy, so one year after your um, uh, diagnosis of colon cancer, we'll repeat the colonoscopy at that time. And then it kind of depends if we don't see um, polyps at that time, then it's a three year interval, and then that can get spaced out to five years. You'll never go further than five years back, but most people are in a three year interval um, after, uh, after being diagnosed. So it's one year and then three, um, depending on if you have polyps. And how often do you see them, Dr. Bartow? I usually see my cancer patients at least every six months for about five years, and then every year after that. And usually, again, they're seen an oncologist, usually Dr. Moore, who's seen the patients every three to six months as well. So we've got, and, and then, you know, I'll, I'll see them in the office and send them, hey, Dr. Keller, this patient needs to have a colonoscopy. Um, and Dr. Moore is on top of it as well. So it's, it's a lot of office visits, it's, it's, but it's something that we don't take lightly. And uh, we, we keep you on track. And Dr. Moore, how long do you continue to follow patients? Yes, yeah, so um, the first two years, every three to four months, and do blood tests, uh, one of which uh, would be a tumor marker called a CEA, which is kind of a, uh, a crude barometer of maybe something that, that's going on. Uh, and for patients with stage two and stage three colorectal cancers, we do a, a scan, a CAT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis once a year for five years. So. I, I typically continue to follow the patients for, for five years, and then after that, it's kind of patient decision, you know. Sometimes it's, it's fun for us to, to still get to touch base with you once a year, because it's like, all right, this is why we do what we do. Um, but sometimes patients are like, man, I've had enough of this. <laughs> so after five years, it's your choice. So um, does everyone get colon, or get um, surgery for colon cancer? Like surgery by Dr. Bartow, or? Is this sometimes the colonoscopy take care of that? Sometimes, very rarely, you can uh, have cancer within the uh, polyp. So we talked about how polyps turn into colon cancer. Well, if we catch it uh, right in the nick of time, sometimes you'll have this polyp, and it kind of looks like a mushroom. Uh, so it has a stalk and then the, uh, the head of the polyp, and they could find cancer inside of it. They call it carcinoma in situ. And I go in, and I, I don't know it at the time, but I'm taking the polyp out. Um, and when the pathologist looks at it, they'll say there's actually some cancer within this polyp. Um, and in that setting, they'll look in the, at the stalk and make sure there was no, no cancer within that stalk. And they'll maybe do some scans to make sure there's no lymph nodes present anywhere. And if that's the case, <coughs> then you may not have surgery. But that probably happens uh, a handful of times a year, maybe less than that. So you kind of touched on this in the very beginning, but um, do, does everybody have the bleeding, abdominal pain, pain right. bloating? Is everyone symptomatic? No. Um, so colon cancer, stage one and two, actually can be a, a totally asymptomatic, meaning no symptoms, no bleeding, no pain. Everybody, you just feel normal. Um, that happens quite frequently. I'll do a screening colonoscopy, and, and we'll find uh, a cancer in there that's early stage, but yet the patient um, had no symptoms. So that's uh, something we don't want to wait for. Um, you don't want to wait for the time where you're starting to not feel right and not um, you're having constipation or bleeding or changing bowel habits. Um, if you, not everybody, but if we stay within the guidelines and, and get screened at age 45 or 50, um, and if you have a uh, family history of colon cancer, um, it should be earlier than 45 or 50, um, we can help prevent um, the cancer from forming. And I think it's important for me to point out, if you have a family history of colon cancer and, and, and that person in, in your family was a first degree relative, that is younger than the age of 60, then um, the guidelines say you need to be screened 10 years prior to that um, person being diagnosed. So let's say they got diagnosed at age 53, um, then you'll need to get screened at 43. And can you clarify, first degree relative is? Like mother, father, brother, sister. Then if you have, uh, and, and also they've added this year, uh, advanced adenomas. And with that, an adenoma is a type of polyp that the type of polyp that turns into cancer, um, and they've added advanced adenomas to that uh, as a family history of uh, colon cancer, advanced adenoma is equal to that. Um, because people are getting their screenings when they should, um, 
if you have a person at 53 that has this large polyp with advanced adenoma, which means it's a step right before colon cancer, we caught it just in time, those people, their relatives need to get screened 10 years prior to that, at age 43. Does that make sense? But so just to add on that, the scary thing is I'll see a lot of patients in my clinic that Dr. Keller has scoped and they come in and we'll ask them, well, what symptoms do you have? And more than 75% say they have no symptoms and they have cancer. And they don't, they didn't know it. You know, two days ago before they got colonoscopies, they didn't know they had cancer. They felt perfect. So that's, again, get your screening colonoscopies. And can somebody take the question of, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of stuff in the media and in the news and in research of people younger than even 45, even though the recommendations have changed, a huge increase in younger people being diagnosed with um, colon cancer. So you know, maybe just talk about maybe why or if we don't know or maybe things that um, could be contributing to that and how um, maybe people can share with their families what their stuff should be. <laughs> I guess it's my turn. Yeah, I got you know, to I gotta keep these two guys happy. <laughs> um, no. Um, well, I think probably the one of the big reasons why we're seeing that, and the the younger you are when you develop any cancer, but in particular a colon cancer and and also breast cancer the higher your likelihood is that you may have one of these hereditary or genetic syndromes. It's estimated that we've only identified about 10 to 15 percent of families that actually carry these genetic syndromes. And so um, I would say as far as impact that our clinic has made, hopefully on the overall generational health of Southeast Missouri in the past five years that I've been here is probably implementing uh, the, the genetic testing program. So those 60 some odd families that have been identified because we ran the test and uh, the patients uh, were willing, that's where you, you make an impact on, on a lot of that. So I think genetics plays a large role, um, but also, um, Dr. Keller hit on earlier, you know, in the prevention keys, but uh, our, our diets. Um, I think genetics and then, then our diets, you know, we eat a lot more processed foods, a lot more foods that have been, you know, hormonally modified, uh, engineered, um, a lot of more simple sugars, our, our, our diabetes rates, our obesity rates, all of these things that weaken our immune systems that allow for these mutations to kind of set up residents and, and grow and proliferate earlier in bodies. Um, I, I think those are the two main things. And Dr. Keller, somebody it hasn't been screened, which I hope you all have, but if you haven't and um, you are ready to take that step, how would you say they would get in touch? Um, what is the process for them to get into our pipeline for scheduling that? So, Gwen, do we have a sign up thing? Or? Nothing here, right? So yeah, you can just call the office, call our office at um, Southeast Health and you can get, um, they will be able to guide you in that and set, and set you up for an appointment. There is also a direct access, so if you are qualified for a colonoscopy and don't have any major medical issues, we can um, get you set up for a colonoscopy over the phone essentially and you won't have to come to the office to, um, to see us before the colonoscopy It'll all be done on the same day. Um, the bowel prep, I guess I should touch on just um, briefly, is a lot better than it used to be. It used to be four liters, and you hear these horror stories of people having to drink these big uh, gallons. It's uh, not the case anymore. We have, um, the one I use is two bottles. I won't use the name for uh, big pharma reasons. But there's two bottles that are eight ounce bottles, and we use a 16 ounce cup, and you just pour the bottle in there and you mix it with water, and you drink that over 10 or 20 minutes. Um, and then you follow it with two cups of Gatorade, and in the morning you wake up and do the same thing again. So essentially it's a 16 ounce cup at night of, of bad of prep, and then 16 in the morning. It tastes, I had my colonoscopy uh, last year, and um, uh, it tastes a little bit like medicinal, maybe like Robitussin, uh, a little bit better than Robitussin, the cough syrup. But it, I was able to get it down, it wasn't a, a big deal. 
So um, I prescribed hundreds of bowel preps, and uh, I finally took a bowel prep uh, last year, so I don't feel like a fraud. <laughs> um, at any rate, um, and, and to be quite honest, it's because of what we just touched on. The, the younger generations are, uh, I'm seeing so many people, I'm 44, and I'm seeing so many people between the ages of 45 and 35, um, and uh, I diagnosed a, a friend of colon cancer at age 42, and I was like, I, I'm gonna, I gotta get mine. So I did it like three weeks later. I was not, you know, wait around. And I think Andrew hit on it. Obesity and, and um, diet are, are a big thing, and processed foods um, are, are um, what we're looking at as far as causing these things. So it's, um, it's important to get screened. You said that a thousand times. <laughs> the key for tonight, if you yeah. pick that up. Um, I will say that Dr. Keller talked about contact in our office. You should each have one of these in your folder, so it has our number on it if you are wanting to um, call us, or we can take your name um, and call you. Um, is there anything else you guys feel like we need to cover or that we've missed before we open it up to questions to the, to the group? One more thing that I kind of thought of. Dr. Keller, do you get screened forever? Are you constantly in a three, five, or ten year interval? Great question. So um, up to 75, and then from 70, 76 years old to 85, um, it's a kind of a case-by-case -case basis, and this is uh, set out by the United States Preventive Task Force. Um, but, uh, yeah, so you get screened up until age 75, and then between the next ten years, um, 75 to 85, it's a case-by-case -case basis. So if your life expectancy is greater than five years, and um, I mean, you, you're likely to get a colonoscopy, it would be recommended that you get a colonoscopy after the age of 85. I continue that, it, take it case-by-case -case basis. If you're taking care of yourself and you're you know, uh, at home and you're driving yourself around town and, and um, don't have a ton of medical problems, then I recommend getting one. I don't think, um, uh, I think you're able to it's not overly taxing on the body. So after the age of 85, I continue that case-by-case -case basis. United States Preventive Task Force says that it doesn't necessarily recommend it, but it's not going to discourage you from getting one after the age of 85. Would those people that maybe don't want to get a colonoscopy, would they be good candidates then for a colon fit? Right, yeah, that's a great question. Yes, so that would be somebody that we would say, hey, let's get a fit test um, and um, uh, see if you have uh, potentially have polyps, and then if it's positive, then we would go forward with the uh, colonoscopy if they, if they want to. Mm -hmm. okay. What questions do you guys have for our panel? I have ulcerated colitis and di diverticulitis. My last colonoscopy, I had eight polyps, but they were benign. I had very excessive bleeding where I needed transfusions afterwards. They said it was because of hemorrhoids that they may have touched. When should I get my next colonoscopy? Right. So for everybody, ulcerative colitis, it's a, um, you have ulcers in your colon. It's a um, chronic syndrome that, or a chronic disease that you, you get treated for. Um, <coughs> After eight years of having uh, ulcerative colitis, it's recommended that you get a colonoscopy every two years from then on. Um, you are a little bit, the tissue is a little more friable, so a little bit, uh, it bleeds a little easier. Um, but uh, that's the guideline. So every two years um, after, in, after eight years after your diagnosis. Does that make sense? Eight years, and then every two years. Eight years. Eight years. Um, so after you first got diagnosed, what year were you oh, diagnosed? Long time ago. Yeah. So you're probably in that two years, years two year years. interval now. Even with the pop, the eight pops. Right. Um, it, it depends on when you say benign. It's hard to say if there were um, they, they want to know there were cancers, but if they were adenomas, is a type of polyp, or something called a hyperplastic polyp, which is a polyp the doesn't turn into colon cancer, so we don't get concerned about that. Um, so it kind of depends on what type of these polyps were. But um, yeah, it'd be two years. Thank you. Yeah. I was going to ask the, the, through the colonoscopy test, is that the only way to detect that? No, like blood tests can't 
show that you already Right. So there's no, no uh, specific blood test, but there are some stool tests. The, the FIT test and something called Cologuard. Um, they're not as sensitive for polyps. But they're, um, but they're certainly options if you want to do not want to go through the colonoscopy for certain reasons. So the FIT test, uh, they've done studies with the FIT test um, versus the colonoscopy. And the colonoscopy detected twice as many polyps as the FIT test. Um, they were close as far as detecting cancer. You know, as we said, it's not the name of the game. The name of the game is prevention. But they were close in detecting cancer. Colonoscopy is about 10% better than FIT test. And then Cologuard, which is a stool DNA test, which you get mailed to you at your house and you mail it off, um, uh, is at about 90% for colon cancer and about 40% for certain kind of polyps that turn into colon cancer, called ulcerated adenoma. So um, not overall great percentages from the, from the fecal uh, studies, the stool studies, to, develop, to detect polyps, but they're okay for detecting cancer. And I only recommend those in the scenario that Jen brought up. Um, somebody that's older, in 80, 85 range, um, that maybe we can do it in that setting, or somebody has some other disease that may be um, a little bit harder on them to get a colonoscopy. And I kind of take it like, how would I treat my family member if my mom was here, or, and that's how I kind of try to look at things. And um, right now, I would not recommend a stool study if I have the ability to get a colonoscopy. Well, let me ask you this. You all say that, you know, taking up this, now, you know, you go to your regular doctor, uh, and if they set up you a colonoscopy, are you all saying that you prefer, are you all specialized in this, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. So if I went to my doctor and say I want a colonoscopy, yeah. and I want it done up at Southeast. Right. So that's what I need to say, right? Yeah. Y'all sound like you know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> touch on that, um, the, I guess, proven um, for reflux is a Nissen front application where you uh, wrap the end of the esophagus with, a, with the end of the stomach, essentially. It would be way outside my field. This is Dr. Barton. But they do that with that robot that he was talking about. And, it's, um, and actually sent my father, my brother-in-law to get that surgery about two years ago, and he's done great with it. So, uh, but that's not my field, that's his field. That's his field. So March is Colon Cancer Awareness Month, which is why we focused on <laughs> colon, just to clarify that. They do all kind of deal with a lot of a lot of other things. And we, you know, you can call our office for, you know, anything going on GI-related, Dr. Keller certainly. Um, we've got a couple of really great nurse practitioners. We'd be more than happy to see you guys for that too. But with this being Colon Cancer Awareness Month and our topic today being prevention and recognizing colon cancer and um, you know how you should proceed through treatment and get screened. That's that's kind of why we're, we're focusing on that. So, that's my question. I'll uh, respond to that question. A colon health is very important to get. And also going to see Dr. Kelly. He's really good. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Bartow is too? <laughs> Dr. Oh, Bartow is too. Dr. Bartow is too. Go ask for Dr. Keller. Because <laughs> I didn't have other colonoscopy before, but they're really good. They're really okay. I got a question. Thank you. Let me get the lady right behind you, real quick. First, oh, okay. okay. 
of our cancer center and we've actually worked together and we went to um, a consortium up in um, Columbia where people all over the state um, kind of came together to talk about and really the MEMA, did you all go to the MEMA program no it wasn't MEMA? that it was um oh what was the was it the colon cancer the colon cancer alliance around, they put around, it table. around table so basically what they they recognize that we are a hot spot and there was a lot of focus on us in our area and um, we talked a lot about our barriers. And so we have tried to work with the American Cancer Society because there are barriers. So south of really, say, Dexter and um, Sykeston, there's not a lot of access to care for what these guys do. Um, and it's a long drive, right? You go three hours or so just to get to one of these guys. Um, so that's a recognized barrier. It's probably part of the reason that we also are a hot spot. Um, you know, this is the first time we've done this in Sykeston because we recognize that there's a need and we have a big patient population um, from the lower part um, or the lower counties in Southeast Missouri. So that's part of the reason that we decided this year that we would do it here because we do it in Cape a lot or every year. Um, so we only do this usually yearly um, around colon cancer awareness month. Um, not to say that we can't more, but just so you guys know it is recognized, but there are a lot of barriers for cost and travel and just access to care. Um, so that's something that is on the radar for a lot of different organizations. Um, but we're kind of starting to just ease our way south. Um, but this is the only one that we currently have scheduled. But if it, you know people who need access to this information, um, you, you've got a whole binder full of things that we've provided to you and you can give us a call. You can give one of our offices a call. Um, you can go on our website and post questions and we can get answers back to you as well. Give the information to a family member or a friend or someone else. Or, you know, things like we've talked to the Holloways about um, talking to your family and friends and maybe people that you go to church with. Of, they just need to get screened. Um, one of the things that was on my list to talk about that we talked about um, at that consortium is the power of three. So if every person in this room talked to three of your family members about getting screened. And then those people talked to three of their people. How quickly would that spread throughout the region? How quickly could we get more people screened and maybe find them at a stage one or two instead of finding cancers at stage three and four or until it's too late to do anything? Because so The reason I was interested in this, I had three brothers to die 
from cancer, and the, all three was younger than I am, and you know, we didn't have this information. Yeah, so it maybe be good for you guys and your family to get connected with Beth and um, you know, start a um, genetic testing for people in your younger generations to see how, what's their potential impact. So that's Especially their sons and daughters. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. And get them screened earlier and earlier and earlier so maybe they don't end up getting cancer or maybe you find it at an earlier um, time in their lives and it's something that Dr. Moore can take care of in just a short amount of time or Dr. Bartow, a small surgery and they're cured. So, yes. Can I add just one thing to you? We've talked about genetic testing here quite a, quite a bit tonight and the importance of that. And I know here again we have that access at our cancer center, um, but here again, you're farther south. But we also have genetic testing in our Bloomfield Southeast Health, Bloomfield oh, Clinic, gosh. Bernie, and Malden. So those are three other clinics too that offer this genetic testing. So once again, if that's a little bit closer for you, you know, by all means, there's primary care there. They can help answer those questions to determine if you should go ahead and have this genetic testing. Am I good on that? Okay. Anything you guys would like to add to any of that stuff that I kind of just took over? <laughs> You had a question? Yes. I heard the good doctor here, the good doctor here, was some say that uh, listen to your body, you know, about this colon cancer. But not all the time that your body tells you. Am I correct? Correct. Yeah. My wife, I had red eyes. She said, uh, you got, uh, your eyes, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be like that. And sure enough, I had, uh, I went to the doctor and I had uh, prostate cancer. Hey, you should to her more often now. <laughs> uh, that's, what, that's, what, that's where I'm going next. Not only do you listen to your body, you listen to your loved ones and your family. She told me. And, 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 and just to uh, come in on what, she had uh, colon cancer. And I looked at her and I said, she didn't have no symptoms. And I said, why don't you I go get her? You had the flu? I had the flu. Okay. And okay. I was losing weight. And I asked her. And I asked her, I said, will you go have a colonoscopy? She did not turn away. She said, yes. And that's where we sent her to uh, Dr. Uh, Freeman, Freeman first. Yeah, Freeman. yeah, and I asked Freeman, I asked Dr. Freeman, I said, you're not going to send us to no clowns, are you? <laughs> 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 he, said, we, he said, we don't do that. <laughs> you know that? He said, we don't do that. And you know, I want to say this, you know, I want to say this about these good doctors here. I, I haven't had any, 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 I know, yeah, any, any okay. people. I've had you and you and, but you know, these are these are these are these are great doctors. They are not are puffed up. They'll listen to what you got to say. Come in and shake your hand. They'll talk to you. I mean, it's a great feeling to go into these people's office. I'm telling you that. If you got to, any calling or anything, it go does. see these guys. It it <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? She's another brother. <laughs> So, um, any, at Southeast Hospital, we take all insurance. Well, I won't say all Illinois. We're, we struggle with that, but um, yeah, Medicare, Medicaid, anything that the hospital takes, the um, physicians employed by Southeast Health will take. Dr. Bartos is. They have their own clinic and, and can. We take there. all insurance. Yeah. So, um, anything that, that Southeast takes, though, is taken also by by these providers. Good right. Dr. Bartos. Yes, ma'am. You've been my doctor since I had COVID cancer. Mm -hmm. You know Dr. Freeman? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's been almost three years. He's still seeing me every six months. Mm -hmm. If that's his normal process to do, it's because yeah. I had it so... It depends yeah. on his findings, and that's why he keeps seeing you. They know what they do. And it's, it's, it's all dependent what upon what he sees when he scopes you. Oh, okay. And so, same with Dr. Keller, he'll have patients that may go three years that have had cancer, or then he has patients that he sees every six months or a year that have had cancer. And it all depends on what, he, what, what is found on that colonoscopy. Some people make a lot of polyps, and they got to keep getting colonoscopies to prevent another cancer from popping up. So that's, that's the key. What are the chances that someone with Crohn's disease getting colon cancer? Yeah, that's a good question. So it is slight increased risk, uh, but not much over the average population. So just a small, less than a percent increased risk of uh, colon cancer, uh, more than the, the average population. So it's a good question. But and as a side note, um, just off that, 
ulcerative colitis question, uh, Crohn's disease, same scenario. After eight years of diagnosis, then uh, you start getting every two year colonoscopies to look for what we call dysplasia or polyps. So it's a little different than the, than the um, average population as far as screening goes. And there's, you know, lots of gastroenterologists that do colonoscopies. There's lots of surgeons that do what I do. Other oncologists that do, do what Dr. Moore does. Yeah. So, he didn't realize that he would refer me. I'm thinking correct. he would do it all. No. no. No, he wouldn't. Okay, I got you. He, he would send you where you needed to be. I got you. Okay, all right. Uh, Dr. Bartow. Sir. Uh, you mentioned uh, what you do with complicated issues in the lower part of what about if you've got cancer right at the beginning? So the, some of the things you have to watch out for. The beginning of the colon is a lot easier to, to take care of. It, it's by your appendix, and it's it's a part of the colon that's pretty easy to take out and not have to give you a bag or, or do a super complicated surgery for that. It's actually when, when do you run into a situation where the ileocecal valve gets to be involved? That's, if it's at the beginning of the colon, that's, we're going to always take out the endocecal valve. And that, that can have some long-term implications, but most, most patients do pretty well with it. Well, we're living with that, that situation, which is why we're here tonight. Yeah. It's been, it's been a year, and uh, it's a tough deal. So are there any general recommendations? Uh, we can talk after the, and get kind of your more specifics on what kind of symptoms you're having. Um, it can cause some diarrhea and things like that long term, but there are some some more case by case basis treatment recommendations. We can talk after. Question, Doctor Bartow. Ma'am, have you had two siblings that have colon cancer? What is the chance of the other one? So the question for some of you in the back who may not have heard is if you have two siblings who have had colon cancer, what's the chance of other siblings also getting it? Perhaps? It's good, but I'll, I would send you to see my handy dandy oncologist and my genetic screener to get genetically screened. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a simple surgeon, so <laughs> that's why I have smart friends like Dr. Moore. So most definitely, and you know, knowing your your family, absolutely, yep. every first degree relative that any of you three have, absolutely sure needs to be screened closely, and not just for colon cancer. So that we are focusing on colon cancer, uh, but but other cancers can be associated with that increased risk: breast, endometrial cancers. Uh, as well. Yes, what I'm saying with that. I have this eight year old kids and my mom. My mom had breast cancer and I had a brother with throat cancer. Two sisters with colon cancer. And my dad died with prostate cancer and his other sister with cancer. So we all had some sort of cancer in our family. You yeah. people should get tested tomorrow. Yeah, yeah that's, you know, that's, <laughs> we've told us. We we've told us. We've told Yeah. Genetic Are the tests uh, specific or how specific? Are you talking about the genetic test? Mm -hmm. So, I, and, and remind me, because that was surprising, and if, if you're okay mm -hmm. with us, us talking about it, that, that, yeah, your, your testing really came back unrevealing. I promise you that if there was an exam that I ever took that had your family history on it, <laughs> I would be, oh man, that's a slam dunk. That is Lynch syndrome, da da da. Well, so, Obviously, we know that you've got the perfect s scenario. Just because this genetic testing comes back right. negative or we don't find something that we can identify, I don't trust that. No. Your family is at much higher risk than the general population. And so it may be that 10 years from now, we, you know, 
we find the Maxine Holloway mutation or something. <laughs> and that's, you know, we're, 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 we're screening for that. But right now we just, we don't know. Because if you look at the way, and, and that's a good point, especially in some of these younger cancer survivors. If you look at the number of genetic conditions we screened for even five or seven years ago, there were three or four. Now, Beth, we have 24, 25 syndromes in this, or, or mutations in this panel of genes that we well, screen for. Actually, they added on four more last week, so we're up to 36. Okay, so, so 36 mutations, whereas when I started in Cape Girardeau, really, we screened for four. Mm -hmm. so, so, so when you take a test, are you testing for a specific cancer or 36? Okay. Oh, what did you say? Well, we're looking at is 36 genes that are linked to okay. eight cancer, that being prostate. One test. Yeah, one okay. test. One blood test. One yeah. blood test looks at all to see if you have all of okay. those. Okay. So that's something that I found interesting, and the more that I learned about this is um, you said that last week they added four more genes. Mm -hmm. So say the people in this room got tested a year ago, and they were being tested at like the 38 or 28 genes or whatever, and now there's four more. How does the company that we're working with, Myriad, deal with those? Do they go back and test those patients to see if they're then positive for those new tests? They notify me if we need to bring them in and test them for those other new updates. So somebody's watching that for you to mm -hmm. see if these new things that they're coming out with, you know, are you somebody that should be One more question. Tested? Yeah. What is the possibility of an insurer excluding me due to genetic Okay, currently, your health insurance will not exclude you, but we do not know about life insurance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, I, I'm with you. Big, big brother's always watching. So I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. Get, get your life insurance before you can get it. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Dr. Keller, he's the man. His hair's yeah. a little more long and curly, but he's actually the guy on this flyer. Yeah. <laughs> shaved and shaved. I mean, I've been in the hospital, I've been upper GI, lower GI, more than once. But still, I have as a reflux. I want to eat. I try to eat. Oh, I was the boy boy man. They have medication for that, don't they? That you can yes. take. Yeah. Are you taking you medication? Yeah, and I take a pill every well, we can Look at that thing. Give us a call. We can see you. Okay. See if we can work it out. Thank you. I had it. And I, I had it. You know, it. I'm not a psychic, baby. What's going on? We waited to do this again. That's right. We were fun. So, uh, there, is a, there is a genetic uh, component to it, so if you have a family, family history, there is, you have a, a slight, sorry, there's a genetic component, so you may have, if you have a family history of colon cancer, you may be a little bit increased risk to get POPs, but otherwise, um, roughly 80% of people who develop POPs and go into colon cancer, is, we call them sporadic POPs, meaning there's no specific reason why you got those POPs. But like I mentioned earlier, you know, taking a baby aspirin or decreasing the amount of ground beef that you eat per week to one serving or less um, may help prevent polyps. But essentially, um, there's a certain percentage of the population that are going to get polyps, and we don't know why they just get them, and that's why it's important to get screened. Again, polyps have no symptoms that come along with them. They don't bleed, so checking a stool test for blood is polyps do not bleed, and they don't cause constipation or diarrhea. They're just there. Just like if you have a mole in the middle of your back, you have no idea unless somebody said, hey, there's a mole back there. You just don't feel it. And so you're not going to feel polyps. So uh, they just grow, and every, you know, not everybody gets them, but um, people can get them and, um, for just unknown reasons. Well, the first uh, colonoscopy I had, I had two, that's mm -hmm. 12 years ago. Okay. I had five years later. I had it seven years ago, yeah. and I didn't 
doesn't have any. Gotcha. So now I'm, I've been notified it's time for me to right. have another one. Yeah. But I'm hearing so much about it tonight. And yeah. That's why I asked yeah. that question. And I have cancer. My mother died with colon cancer. Gotcha. Uh, my dad's sister died with female cancer. Yeah, so it's certainly uh, time to get screened again and look. Now, um, given your family history of colon cancer, you'll always be in that five-year realm, but if you didn't have a family history, this next one you may spread out to 10 years um, afterwards. So you're 58 now, then, you know, oh, yeah, don't you turn. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a lot of great information in there tonight. You've got information regarding, you know, who these folks are, where they're located, um, and we've got information about our primary care team, not only in Cape, but also in Dexter. So, um, you know, of course, you know, you're seeing just a snippet of like our oncology team and, and, so, and the general search team and that sort of thing. And I do want to thank these guys for coming out tonight yes, and taking their yes. time to do that. Um, but a lot of good people to help you guys. Sure, yeah. so. so any other questions you may have, or if you'd like to come and see any or all of us, hopefully not all of us, but um, <laughs> primarily, you know, start with Dr. Keller. Um, but that's in, in your um, booklet as well. And for those of you who are maybe here for the air fryer, um, if you open your um, folders, there is one lucky person in here that has a sticker on the left-hand side that says colon cancer awareness. Uh, prevention. It's going to say it's going to be written. It's going to be written in your folder, and it says colon cancer prevention, and it should be on the left side. It should be on the folder itself. It's not oh, evidently, it's written. It's Sorry. Written. It's just written. Aha! Uh -huh, there it is. Oh. <laughs> Thank you all so much Big for coming tonight. Thank you to our panel. We really appreciate you guys coming out.